I have to warn you, I will be talking a little bit about ultra running, but this is not really about ultra running. This is just an example to prove my points. I absolutely don't want to talk anybody into it. How many runners do we have in the audience today? Okay, do you know the difference between a uh, marathon and an ultra run, an ultra marathon? By definition, a marathon is a 26.2 miles foot race. This is what most people consider the maximum of human capabilities. And an ultra run is everything above that. 30 miles, 50 miles run and more. Marathons are run on flat streets, while ultra marathons are run in difficult terrain, through mountains, through deserts. You can physically prepare for a marathon and finish it without difficulties. But in an ultramarathon, none of the participants can be really sure he will finish. Even the best preparation can't protect you from suffering and from unexpected crisis. The art of ultra running is the art of overcoming this crisis. This is the art of making your mind prevail over the weakness of your body. It's the art of suffering. You look like this after a marathon, but you look like this after an ultra marathon. <laughs> this guy takes a rest in the nettles after an 80 kilometer mountain run. His friend stands there and says, hello, have you forgotten you were afraid of snakes? Six years ago, I was told I wouldn't survive another year. No, I'm not going to tell you a sub story. I wasn't sick. I just decided to do something that by far exceeded my limits, to run an ultramarathon. An impossible undertaking, considering the fact that I'm not particularly athletic, as you see. And I have never been. I had no idea how to run 100 kilometers. I mean, how to do it, how to get down to it. I shared this idea with my father. His reaction was immediate. 100 kilometers running in the desert? Are you crazy? Do you realize what kind of people go there? You're gonna die there. Did you know that most people don't realize their dreams because they consider them impossible to achieve? And that's why they don't do anything to actually realize them. Often we think something is impossible just because we don't know how to do it. I have a simple method for that. Ask somebody who has done it before. <laughs> so I looked up in a phone book a two-time winner of the race that I wanted to run. I called the guy to get his advice on how to do it. He didn't take me seriously. Maybe because I was a complete greenhorn. But I didn't give up. After my third call, he finally relented and explained to me how to prepare, how to train, what equipment to use. After six months of cruel training and over 1,000 miles run in the preparation, I did something that I had considered impossible before. Despite horrendous fatigue, I not only finished that ultramarathon, but I took place in a better half of the field. Impossible is easier than you think. I realized that most of the limitations we are exposed to in our lives are not physical limitations imposed on us by laws of nature. Virtually all limitations we are subject to are mental limitations, are limitations in our heads. So if you think something is impossible, then in the first line it's just your thought. And the reality may be completely different. Impossible is just an opinion. Six months before, I considered running 100 kilometers to be impossible for me. In reality, it turned out to be absolutely doable. Of course, after a proper preparation. I thought to myself, I did something in sports that I had considered impossible. Let's see if I can do anything impossible outside of sports. I am a businessman. 
I built a multi-million dollar company, but I always looked up to billionaires. Billionaires with capital B, not millionaires. Billionaires are the best entrepreneurs. They build huge value. They create huge companies. For example, a typical billionaire, they own 200 hotels or 400 factories or 3,000 restaurants. I came up with the idea to learn from the very best entrepreneurs in the world. To meet and interview self-made billionaires. And then to publish the secrets of their success in a book. A great vision, would you say. But there is one hitch. Nobody has ever done anything like this before. There were local projects with millionaires like the one by Napoleon Hill 100 years ago. But nobody has ever worked with dozens of billionaires on a global book project. Nobody has ever tried to. Why? Because the venture seems impossible to complete. Let's look at the stats. Billionaires are an extremely rare breed. Only one in five million people on average is a billionaire. That means that the probability of meeting a billionaire by chance is comparable more or less to winning the main pot in the national lottery. For my book, I needed to meet and interview at least 20 billionaires. Do you know anybody who won the pot in the national lottery 20 times? Common sense tells us this is plain impossible. And now imagine how overwhelmed I was when faced with the challenge of this magnitude. I mean, where to start, how to get to them. But then I got the first promising contact from a friend. It was the phone number belonging to former employee of one of the billionaires. I needed to call the guy and convince him to put me in contact with that billionaire. I was hesitating for weeks, gathering courage, weighing our pros and cons, procrastinating. I was scared to death to take this first step. But fear is the worst enemy of success. The tool I often use in my different challenges is the so-called promise card. It looks like this. I wrote on it, I will write and publish a world bestseller by end of June 2016. I made 20 copies of that, distributed them among friends. Then the friends could hold me accountable for my promise and I always carry one copy with me so I don't forget it. And I made these cards when procrastinating with the call and one of the copies I gave to the friend who gave me the phone number. His reaction changed my life beyond recognition. He said, listen, I gave you a contact to a billionaire and you are giving me some damn scrap of paper instead of taking action? Come on, pull yourself together, get serious. And I humbly took the phone and called the guy. And that's how my great adventure started. Since then, astonishing things happened. I have traveled several times around the globe. Today, I personally know and have met 30 billionaires. Do you know anybody who won the pot in the national lottery 30 times? The wealthiest people in the world spend time with me, invite me to their homes for lunch, for dinner, send me Christmas cards or call me. This guy, for example, owns four and a half thousand restaurants. Four and a half thousand. I mean the one on, on your right, of course. <laughs> Five years ago, if somebody told me how my life would look like today, I would declare him insane. And all that happened because of what this friend made me realize that the gap between ignorance and knowledge is much less than the gap between knowledge and action. So it's not about knowing, it's about doing. Take action, just do it. Do the first step even if you don't know the next steps. Take risk even without guarantee of success. What else can we learn from that story? That independently of how improbable your goal is, your directed action can actually bend the probability in your favor and what seemed impossible becomes possible for you. 
Impossible. It's easier than you think. Two years after my first ultramarathon, I took a challenge of 111 kilometer non-stop run through the Sahara Desert. It's called Sahara Ultra 111. This was the most traumatic experience of my life. Never in my life have I suffered as much as during that race. But apparently, it was a borderline experience not just for me, to be clear. <laughs> the field consisted of the best European ultra runners, except for me, an amateur. Despite that, almost half of the participants give up during the race due to circulatory collapse, dehydration, or sunstroke. And majority of those who finished lost their consciousness along the way. Before the race, these pros were looking at me and thinking there was absolutely no way I'm going to finish that race. And indeed, the run turned out to be an ordeal. I started with an injured knee. After only 20 kilometers, I had wounds on my feet and blood was squelching in my shoes. After 32 kilometers, I realized it's over. I was shocked because I was prepared maybe for a crisis after 60 kilometers, but after 32? How was I going to run another 80 kilometers if I was at the end of my rope already after 32 kilometers? I was getting stuck in the sand. I couldn't breathe due to jammed nerve. I was limping and with every step, pain in my knee paralyzed me and my wounded feet went numb. And on top of that, I was boiling in my own sweat. I decided to quit. But then I realized I told all my friends about this race. Remember the promise card? <laughs> and now they were sitting in their homes, crossing fingers for me, cheering for me. After several ultramarathons, I had a reputation of being a tough guy already. And now, should I give up? What am I going to tell them? I had pain in my knee? <laughs> Simply not an option. So I consciously opted for another 16 hours of torture with no guarantee of finishing the race. I decided to push on as long as I was conscious, until I drop. If you want to do the impossible, cut off your way back and put yourself in a situation with no return. And now, the worst, the hottest part started. It was 105 Fahrenheit, 40 degrees Celsius, in the shade. But there was no shade. <laughs> I was literally reeling, exhausted and overheated. I was in agony, I had hallucinations. I realized now it is really over. But then I recalled Winston Churchill's words. If you are going through hell, keep going. And these words saved me because it felt like as if he had tailored these words for me, for this situation. And I realized that success is achieved by those who don't give up and fight until they achieve it. And now my goal was just to take another step and not drop from exhaustion and another step and another step and try not to think how many steps they are ahead. Of course, on the way to the finish line, I experienced several other severe crises. Despite that, I managed to reach the finish line at the kilometer 111. It took me 21 and a half hours of hellish struggle. During the race, I drank 20 liters of water and lost 12 pounds of my body weight in just one day. As of today, only three people in the world finished this race without fainting, and I'm proud to be one of them. I realized that even if you think it's over and there is no way you can continue, even when you are at the end of your rope, and you can't take any more pain. Even then, it doesn't really mean it's over. In reality, you can endure much, much more. In my case, I thought it was over after kilometer 32. In reality, I could run 80 kilometers more until the finish line at the kilometer 111. 
you can do much more than you realize. I realized how far in our everyday lives we are from the limits of our capabilities, how little from our enormous potential we usually exploit. If we can only get close to our limits, we can astonish the world and ourselves, because only those who will risk going too far can possibly find out how far one can go. Which of your dreams do you consider so improbable that you are afraid to go for it? When are you going to take the first step after that? Or maybe you would like to experience this magic as long as you are alive. The magic to do the impossible, to realize even your most improbable dreams. We can act only in the present. It's only in the here and now that we can create the future and make our dreams of today become the reality of tomorrow. But tomorrow may never come. So don't put it off. Do the first step today and always remember, impossible is easier than you think. Thank you.